today, uh, as you guys will hear as I'm speaking, we're from Nashville, Tennessee. And I just have to tell you, our elevation is 600. And so I keep having to fight the desire to like lean over and get my breath every time I walk somewhere. And so I was already thinking like, I got to walk up those two steps and get up here and catch my breath again. So y'all just bear with us if we have to like stop and breathe for a minute, okay? But anyway, my name is Sheila Harper, and I'm the president and founder of Save One. And you did such a great job introducing us. Thank you so much. But I, there's only one correction, and we just surpassed 300 chapters now around the world. So and that was just last weekend. So we're thrilled about that. So anyway, what we do is we help men, women, and families recover after abortion. And a lot of times people, when they hear that, they think, well, you know, why are you helping those people who chose abortion? Aren't we trying to stop abortion? So why are you helping those people who are making that choice? And I just have to tell you, I believe, and we see it happening all the time at Save One, that this is the key to ending abortion in our country and around our world. And let me tell you how I know that. I am one who chose abortion on March 29th, 1985. And it was by far the most regrettable, most horrific mistake of my entire life. I spent the next seven years just becoming reliant upon drugs and alcohol just to get through the day. I had convinced myself that God would never accept me back after choosing something so horrible. And so I believed every lie the enemy was telling me up until the point where I thought the only way to fix my pain was suicide. So I attempted suicide during this seven-year period, and thank God he intervened. I finally found my way to a faith-based Bible study, much like the one Save One offers now, and it completely changed my life. And it wasn't anything special that the women did who led me through this study. It was seriously just God's word coming in and healing me from the inside out. I kept looking for this natural answer to a problem that is only fixable through a supernatural God. And so since then, that was in 1992, since then I have not been able to be silent about what God did for me, how he set me free, how I realized his grace does extend over the sin of abortion. And I, I, I don't want any of my brothers and sisters to be led off to believe the same lie I believed. So we are seeing at Save One, as we have developed this whole ministry, when God showed me that these men and women needed a platform to tell the stories of truth, because we're not hearing the truth in the media. We're not hearing the truth from politicians. This issue is not a Democrat or Republican thing. It's not a political issue. The issue of life is a church issue. It's a biblical issue. It's something that the church with a capital C should be dealing with. That's why I'm always so thankful when we have pastors who aren't afraid to speak of this issue from the pulpit. They're not worried about the controversy they may stir, and I'm sorry, you may. But they, they know that this is an issue that is close to God's heart. It's not okay that this is happening on our watch. Have you ever thought about the fact that we're here at this time on earth as the answer? Like God has given us his answer to take it to people and, and tell the truth of what's really going on. We're supposed to be his hands and feet. And this is happening while we're here. We've had 47 years of legalized abortion in our country. And it's heartbreaking when you look at the numbers. The numbers are over 60 million. We just surpassed 62 million abortions just in America. When you average that out across our population, it's one out of every three women, which means that's one out of every three men have lost fatherhood. And each one of those abortions affect a family. There's grandparents attached to that child. There are siblings that come later that suffer from this. And so when God showed me to, to start Save One because we needed to hear the truth, but you really can't go tell that truth until you're healed. 
And so once you're healed, when you've spent time with God, it's like the, those people, this army of truth tellers that we like to say that we're building at Save One, they become the loudest advocates, the greatest mouthpieces that we have for the pro-life movement, the ones who know the truth. And the ones who know the truth of what abortion really does to you are the ones who should be in our communities telling that truth. But you can't really go tell that truth until you come back and you surrender that part of your heart to God. And it's always so hard. I know. It seemed like every time I would show up at my dad's church, which was very rare because I, I just felt so condemned every time I went in there. But every time I would show up, the people from the pregnancy center was, were there to talk. And it was like, oh my gosh, do they not ever do anything else but have these people every single week? And I would have a physical reaction because I was convinced I was the only one in that church who had ever chosen abortion. I would sweat, I would start breathing hard, but I would try not to cry. I just wanted to go running out the back door. And so I know that there are people here today who you're feeling that way right now. My presence and what I'm talking about makes you remember that time in your life. But I'm also here to tell you there is healing, there is hope. Question why you keep holding that part of your heart back. Question why that shame is still there. It's because the enemy knows a person who is healed is a powerful tool in the hands of a powerful God. And so when you get healed, it doesn't mean like we're going to say, okay, here's your microphone, now go get on stage, you know. You don't have to do that. It means that you are just that willing vessel, that you're walking around with the truth. And it is uncanny how God will steer to you the people who need to hear what he's done. Some of the most incredible, most powerful ministry we do is across the backyard fence with your neighbor. When you know the truth, the issue comes up, and all of a sudden you're telling your story. And you're like... I would have never done that before I got healing through Jesus Christ. And seriously, we're seeing people come through these studies that my husband and I wrote for women, for men, and for family members. There's three different studies, but they all mirror each other so everybody can be in the same group. You may have a grandparent from one family, a father who experienced abortion, and a mother who chose abortion. And they're all in that same group going through this together. And so when you get that healing, you just, it, it is an absolutely beautiful thing to tell your story and know that you're not having this huge emotional reaction, you're surprised by it, and you're able to tell the truth and convince people otherwise because they're not hearing the truth out in the world. Revelation 12.11 tells me that this is the key. Because Revelation 12:11 says we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so when, as children of God, we're covered by the blood of the lamb, and when we go out and tell God, I, I want to be a truth teller, so you just lead me, then he brings to you and you're able to talk and you overcome the enemy in other people's lives. And that's how we're going to end abortion in our country and around our world. It's not through politics. We, don't, we, we can't opt out of politics. We have to be involved. But it's when the church rises up and says, we're not going to do this anymore. We're, we are going to talk about this in church. We are going to help those who have chosen abortion to become part of this army of truth tellers. And so I know that's a lot of information I've given you at one time, but I hope I've made you curious as to abortion recovery and the power behind this. So we've got a table out here. Please come by. I would love to answer any questions that you have. I'd love to hear your comments, that all our books are available out there. Get you a cool T-shirt, because the more books and T-shirts you buy, the more people we can reach. So, and, and plus, we would just love to meet you and talk to you. So anyway, thank you so much. It is our honor to be here. And my husband is going to come now and preach. Thank you. So this morning, um, Sheila's told you a little bit about Save One. We're actually in five, on five continents. We're in 24 different countries, 36 states here in America. Uh, Pastor said that the books have been translated 
into 20 languages. And, and what I want to tell you about that is that's not because Sheila and I are marketing gurus. In fact, neither one of us have ever taken a college-level marketing class. We, this happens because the need is great and because God has opened doors continually for our ministry to go and to help the hurting those that are abortion-wounded. So one of the things that Sheila and I have known since the beginning is that if we're going to do this ministry, if we're going we're gonna to be effective then the effective work that we do should affect change in other people. And so what, we, what we've known all along is that we can, build, we can build this and we can have a framework and we can have structure about it, but if we don't do it based on God's word, then we're not going to be effective and it's not going to affect change in the kingdom. And so what we wanted to do is to make sure that everything that we do is lined up with God's word. So in lining up with God's Word, you just simply have to read the Bible. You know, we, we can read and we can look at and we can discover how is it that God touches people, how is it God changes people, what does He do in those moments and what happens based on those moments. So that's what I want to do this morning. I just want to go through a very simple story with you guys in the Bible. If you want to turn to Matthew 9, Matthew 9, verse 1. We're, I'm going to read from there, and actually, if you guys will just bear with me, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through this story and talk about it a little bit as we go. This story is actually repeated in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You guys will know it from Mark 2, you will know it from Luke 5, and there's a little difference, there's a new, different nuances in each of, the, each of the stories that you find out, but they're all the same story. And this story is about the man who is paralyzed and his friends bring him to Jesus who's teaching so one of the cool things that I that I think about this is that in one story it mentions that there's four friends in another story it mentions that they actually ripped the roof off of the house to be able to let the man down in front of Jesus and I think that's really cool pastor this is this is the services that we want to have all the time the house was full in other words there wasn't anywhere in this place that they could bring that man, that they could walk in order to get to Jesus. All the chairs were full. All the aisles were full. It was packed all the way to the doors. The stage was full. The worship area was full. Only Jesus had one spot to be in. And other than that, everything is covered. This is revival. This is the type of services we want in our house all the time. Those will happen if we go out and we invite people, if we go out and tell our testimony, if we go out and tell the story of Jesus and what he's done for us, his love for us. That, that is what brings people to the house, I promise. So Jesus is, Jesus is teaching, and this is the way the story goes. In Matthew 9, verse 1, it says, So he got into the boat and crossed over. He came into his own city. And then, behold, they brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. So they had picked this man up off of his bed. I don't think it's a traditional like four-poster bed like we have. I think this is more like a mat. It's referred to in other stories. But he's on a bed. And then it says this. It says, when Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith. It doesn't say that he saw the man on the mat and saw his faith. He saw their faith. And the reason I want to stop right here and just hang out for just a second is that their faith is our faith. It, it is the faith of the church. It's the faith of Casper faith. It is the faith of us that affects the, the change in other people's lives. What happens here is unity is produced when we all come together in faith. When we are all believing, when pastor has a vision and he has a vision for the church and he starts to walk that vision out, if everybody in the church gets behind that vision and starts to walk in step together, there is a power that comes from that. And so when he saw their faith, he, he knew that he could work with that. So when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, be of good cheer. Now, I, that's, that's kind of odd to me to read that for the first time. Be of good cheer. Sheila and I have known the Shabergs for, for quite a while, and never once have I had to look at, uh, at Pastor Allen, Pastor Colleen, and say, you know what, be of good cheer, guys. You know why I never have to do that? Because they're always in a good mood. They're always, you know, they may have stuff going on, but they've got 
a good continence about them. They, they, you know, they're, they're always happy when we're around them. So that evidently, if he had to tell the man, be of good cheer, there was something going on within the man that wasn't of good cheer, right? Is that, that, that's not a theological stretch there. And if he's telling him to be of good cheer, there's something wrong. It's what we experience with Save One. We have this moment when people come to us and they're down, they're hurting, they're, they're, they're grieving what has happened in their life, wh whether they made the decision or that decision was thrust into their world without their knowledge. They are hurting, they have shame, they have guilt, they have grief. And what it is, is that Jesus wants to deal with that part before he goes forward. Why does he do that? Because, you know, we have emotions. You guys, during worship today, worship was powerful. In fact, I started crying during worship because I knew the Lord was in the house. I knew that there was movement. Can I tell you that Sheila and I, we travel almost every weekend. We go to services, we go to churches that that doesn't happen all the time. And so when it started here, I was like, I was so excited. And I'm telling you, I was, I was getting excited because the Lord was moving. It made, it, it was a spiritual moment, but my emotions started to feel it. And when my emotions were reacting with my spirit, man, I started to cry during worship. And I, I just knew God was going to move and touch and help and, and engage with people this morning. I love that. But the emotions that we have are the most shallow thing that he has given us to worship with him. The emotional state of, can go up and down based on music. It can go up and down based on circumstance. It can go up and down based on what we have wearing or what Sheila says to me while I'm driving. All of those things. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> emotions, they get, they get messed up. God does work in the deep end. He does work in the spirit, but the shallow end can keep the work from happening in the deep end. And so the reason that Jesus said, be of good cheer, is he wanted to address that part of it first. He wanted to address the thing that, it was, that was maybe keeping him from getting to the deep end. And then there was a second part that he says. And I love this part. He says, your sins are forgiven. They brought a paralyzed man to him. The first thing he does is he deals with his, with his emotional state. And then the next thing he does is he starts talking about he's forgiven of sin. Why is that? It's very simple because we can bust hell wide open walking if we haven't gotten our, our lives right. And so Jesus gave, he gave, he gave him forgiveness in that moment. It's something that from save one standpoint, over and over and over what we see is, is that that some, of the, that some of the people that they come, they've asked forgiveness every day. Every day. They, they just can't imagine that God can forgive them for that. And others have, have maybe said at one time, but then they just don't even go there because they think God would never forgive. Why even ask? We walk around in this sin nature and, and we have sin. Then it keeps us from our relationship with Him. It distances us. If God says, my ear's not heavy and my hand's not short, but your sins separate you from me. And so we want to do the lesson when when what I'm telling you guys, and and I'm I'm not I'm not trying to tell you how you have to think, but what I'm telling you is that people have opinions about what happens in this process. We earned ours. In '85, she had the she had the abortion. '88, we got married, and then for four years I lived watching my wife struggle to get through days. I've watched my wife struggle to get through life. I've watched my wife struggle to be a, a wife, to be a woman, to be a mother. All of these emotional things were wrecking her. And sin had gotten a hold of her and was trying to destroy her. That's what he does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so that sin nature has to be dealt with. And that's what happened with this faith-based Bible study that she went to. Can I just tell you, when good work is happening in the house of the Lord, there's going to be people that start talking. Don't listen. In fact, in fact, don't, not, don't just not listen, but stop gossip, stop murmuring. All it does is divide and destroy a house. Don't let that happen. People would come... People would come in my early days when I was a little less polished. 
and they would want to tell me about a prayer situation that somebody had. And I would tell them, don't dump that garbage on me. I don't want to hear that. If you want to pray for them, pray for them. But you don't go telling other people's business to other people. Stop that. doesn't have anything to do with you and them. Then just be quiet. I, I've, I've learned to be a little more diplomatic with it, but I, it's the same response. I mean, just don't gossip. Gossip destroys. But these, these, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these, all these guys... It says that um, the scribes, I think is what, what he actually says, at once the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes, accusing Jesus of blasphemy. What a, what, a, what a thought. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, can I just tell you that whatever you got going on in your life, he knows what's going on, whether you've said it out loud or not. So deal with it with him. He says, why do you think evil in your hearts for which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say arise and walk? I mean, which, one, which one's easier? That, that's a, an awesome question. But that you may know the Son of Man has power to forgive on earth, to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. It's what we see it happening at Save One every day. In fact, it happens multiple times a day, every day based on the, the, the information that we have on book sales and how ministry happens in classes, it happens multiple times a day that people begin and finish the Bible study, and the Bible study does nothing but connect them to Jesus where they can stand up and walk out whole and healthy and healed by the, by the Word of God and that they become a successful and healthy part of a church, healthy part of a society. And I can tell you that they're not healthy when they're having to deal with the things that people that, are, that have had an abortion or have been thrust into that, they're not healthy until they walk through this process. And it doesn't, you know, listen, there's nothing magical that, that we've done. There's nothing about us. It's just about God's word connecting people to, to himself. And so you, you, might, you might ask, you know, I mean, just based on this story, why, why would I pick this story? Because based on your faith, based on the faith of Caster, Cas, Casper Faith, this church, you can help people over and over and over again. Because what you guys are are the rope holders to the hurting in this community. And if you will take the ropes and bring people to Jesus, Jesus will change them. And if you will, you will take the time to invest, to hold that rope and to carry it. Can I just tell you, if, if you guys have ever had a rope in your hand, and I'm sure you have, if you've ever had a rope in your hand, it's not the easiest thing to do is to carry something just holding the rope because all of the weight gets transferred to your hands. And then if you have more than one person holding the rope, then you have to walk in unity because if you don't walk in unity, the ropes can be longer on one end, shorter on the other. If it becomes too long on one end, short on the other, it will just dump out whatever you're holding. Can you imagine if they all weren't in unity and they were bringing this man to Jesus they, they're coming down the road and one of them is pulling really tight and the others let it go. They just dump the man out on the road. That's what would happen. Can I tell you, if you walk in unity with your pastor, you won't be dumping people out on the road. If you'll walk in unity with the vision that God has given him for the church, you'll see people saved. You'll see people coming to Jesus in, in, new, in big numbers. If you'll, if you'll walk in step with unity with his vision for this church, the hurting will be healed. And you'll see healings that will happen spiritually, mentally, and physically in people's lives. Because that's what Jesus does. You just got to get them in front of him. The other thing about that too, and I don't know. See, I, I don't know anybody here at Casper Face, so I don't know who you are, but I know this. When they got this man to Jesus, when they brought him into the, to the area and the place was full and they couldn't walk him in, there was one guy, and Pastor, you know who this guy is in your church. There was one guy who says, you know what? We can just tear the roof off this place. There's somebody that is not going to be stopped just because of physical limitations. There's somebody that has that greater level of faith. that says, you know what? We can't stop here. We can keep going. Can I just tell you, you can aspire to be to that person, but you've got to walk in unity with your pastor because it all happens in unity. And then when they got the guy up there, 
there's only two ways to let him down. It's either to let him down by the ropes. If you saw the chosen, they had a pulley system up on the roof. I didn't know they had pulley systems up on the roofs of houses. But maybe that happened that way. But you can either drop him or you can let him down easy. If Jesus is going to heal him, you can drop him. It should be okay. But, but I think it's better for the guy if you just ease him down and you put him right in front of Jesus. Yeah, out of respect. Thank you. But what I want to tell you is either way, however you do it, if you bring somebody, if you, if you are just telling people what Jesus has done in your life, the reason that this message is so important to us and so important to tell people is because we've lived it. And then in 2 Corinthians 1, it, it tells us that we have to comfort others with the comfort that we've been comforted with. If we don't comfort others with the comfort that we've been comforted with, we're just taking that one scripture in the Bible, we're turning our page and we're saying we're not going to do that. Can I tell you I was raised in that already? Well, we don't do Acts, skip it. We don't do Joel, skip it. We don't do tongues, skip it. We don't do prophecy, skip it. I don't have a Bible with holes in it. Genesis to maps, I'm in. Whatever God said, that's where we're going. And if God has said that we're to comfort others with the comfort that we've been comforted with, then we got to go out and do that. It's a mandate. It's not a suggestion. It's for us. And it's for Sheila and I. We've looked at this and we've said, you know what? We'll not stop. We will not keep this quiet. So what I want to just encourage you guys if for those of you that are in the room, that you're, your family, you personally, have been affected by abortion. Sheila told you 62 million abortions since Roe versus Wade. 47 years in our country that legalized abortion has been the law of the land. If that's happened to you, out of the ashes, God brings up beauty. There is hope that rises out of those ashes. God is looking for you. He's been wooing you to come to Him. 62 million abortions, 320-something million people in this, in this country. That means that one out of every abortion touches about 25 people in, the, in this country. It probably is more than that. And why do you, you know what, how we know that is because if one abortion has a mother and a father, and their, their parents are affected by that. So that's another four people. And then siblings, most families have two siblings or two children and they're affected by that. And then aunts and uncles of the parents. And it just spreads out so quickly. And can I tell you, abortion spills over into friendships and into relationships. It spills over into jobs. It, there's not an end to this. And Satan loves that. But I'll tell you what God loves is He loves a church that's willing to stand up and to do something about it. He, he loves a church that's willing to help the hurting. And I can tell you this too, that this message today is not just about abortion because I can tell you, I was sitting in a church on September 6, 1998, third row back, aisle seat, left-hand side of the building. It's an altar of victory for me. I, w I came in an alcoholic. I left delivered, and, and I don't even know what he preached that day. All I know is that God started talking to me. I thought everybody heard it. And when God started talking to me, I started saying, yes, sir. That's what I want, but I don't know how to do it. For 23 years, I was an alcoholic. I left that day and haven't drank since. 22 years sober, clean, without problems as far as drugs and alcohol go. So the reason I'm telling you that is because that this room today can be a day of salvation. This room today can be a day of change. It can be a day of repentance. It can be a day of laying things down because God delivers. And then in that moment of delivery, He expects us to be disciples to be disciple maker and to be disciple. And what he wants you to do is connect with your groups in here in this church. He wants you to connect with your kids, with the youth, and your children with children. He wants you to connect with the men. He wants you to connect with the women, the, the prime timers. I love that. I saw that as I was coming in. Everybody has a place here. I love that. And if you will connect and join, then you will start to mature yourself. God will mature you. And oh, those around you, they will sharpen you and they will help you get to where you need to be.
because of because of COVID, because of the things that are going on right now, normally I would have a moment where we come to the altar, where we have a moment where we accept change in our lives, where we accept that maybe, you know what, maybe before today you just thought, you know, pro-life movement, we need it, but I've never really done anything about it. Maybe today you would commit to just pray, pray for, pray continually for the unborn, pray continually for those that are abortion wounded. Maybe you want to hold the ropes for, for Save One. For years, Sheila and I, as we started Save One, I was in business and, and she, would, she would call me and she would say, we need to order books. And what that means is I need a check. And so for years, we were, we were the, you know, Harper Adjusting, which was the company that we had, we wrote the checks. And she got tired of, of, of being nervous about calling me, so she would have one of her board members call me. And Donna would call and she would say, Jack, we need some checks. And I would do it because I could. I, I loved holding the ropes in that way for, for Save One. And then in 2007, we planted a church and, and, and the ministry money wasn't the same as the business money. That's not a problem. It, it's, it's just different. And we, we, came, we came to a point to where she couldn't call me anymore and ask me for checks. And we started having to allow other people to write checks and to ask other people to help us. What we were asking them is to hold the ropes. But even more than that, guys, and listen to me, this is the last thing I want to, last point I want to get into, is that sometimes we have to be willing to, put, to get on the mat. We have to be willing to get on the bed sometimes and let other people help us and that was 2007 you know what we were worried we didn't know how money would come we didn't know how that would happen from 2007 to, to now 13 years later God continues to have people hold our ropes because we were willing to get on the mat can I tell you if you're hurting from something today if you have uh, an addiction or some kind of uh, life controlling issue in your life today's the day of salvation for you today is the day that God can deliver for that for those of you that are abortion wounded for those of you that have had the, an experience with somebody in the family and it has bothered you and you don't know what to do it today is the day of the beginning of the journey to walk through discipleship through this book and to see that God does bring beauty from ashes so can I just ask everybody in the room to just close your eyes and bow your heads for just a second. And I got just a couple of questions and, and I'm not going to take a long time, but I want to ask you this. Is there anybody in here who doesn't know that their eternal home is established? They don't. Is there anybody in here that just knows that maybe you hadn't been living the way that Jesus wants you to? Is there anybody that isn't secure in your relationship with God? Any of that, would you just stick your hand up and put it back down? Not going to ask you to come forward. Just want to know how we're praying right now. Anybody in the room? Anyone? Okay. Now, this is glorious because what, what we're in is a room full of believers. This is glorious because a room full of believers is one of the most powerful things that you can stand in because you've got people from one side of the room to the other, from the front to the back, who are willing to walk in unity and to, to put yourselves in that place of prayer and in that place of maturity and in that place of being willing to hold the ropes for other peoples. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I just want to ask you this, and, and, and if everybody in the room would stand, if you're able, if you would, everybody in the room would stand right now, I just want to lead you in a prayer. And this is not a prayer of salvation, but this is a prayer of, you know what, we're going to start doing something. We're going to just engage in this life process. We're going to engage in this process of people coming to know the Lord in true, uh, in the fullness of the Lord, understanding that He helps, that He that he heals, that he does what he says he does. And if, you, if everybody in the room would just pray with me at the same time, I'm just going to lead it, but everybody in this room has a powerful prayer in them. This is your victory song. Let this prayer go. So, Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you are doing in this room today, Lord. We thank you that there are rope holders in this room, God, rope holders who have come today and heard and know that, God, that you are able 
as long as we bring people to you that you do what you say you will do. Lord, that there is healing in the house today. Lord, that there is deliverance in the house today. Lord, that there is a place of victory in this house today. Lord, there's a place in the army today, Lord, an army of truth-tellers that no longer is willing to just let people go unaware, to let their brothers and sisters not be kept, but to keep them, Lord. And so today, Lord, I pray a blessing over this house, Lord. We thank you for their hospitality. Lord, I pray a blessing over this house. I pray, a, I pray an anointing over this house, Lord, that, that this would be a place where the hurting are brought, Lord. That this would be a place where those that are struggling in the community can come and to, to experience you in a supernatural way, Lord. Lord, we're not willing to just do it the way we've been doing it, but God, you have opened doors for us. And so, Lord, in this day, I pray an anointing over this place. God, that they would, they would have the unity to walk with the vision of Pastor Craig. Lord, that they would have that a unity and it would break the yoke of bondage in people's lives. Lord, it would produce an anointing so powerful that people cannot stay away from this place. So, Lord, in all things, we thank you in advance. And, Lord, we give you glory and praise and honor for you are worthy, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody say, Amen. Thank you, guys.